years in history. Cutstown University professor Michael Gabriel teaches a class about military engagements during the American Revolution from April 1775 to July 1776. He highlights the Battle of Bunker Hill, the American invasion of Canada, and the eventual British evacuation of Boston. His class is about an hour. Okay, everybody. So, last class, we were talking about the outbreak of the American Revolution. We say all this tension is building. In the spring of 1775, in April, uh, General Thomas Gage sends troops into the countryside. Fighting breaks out at Lexington and Concord. And as night falls, about 20,000 Americans descend on Boston, lay siege to the city, and this war that nobody really wants, but since been brewing probably for... Uh, 12, 13 years has started. So today we're going to talk what's called Raj Militaire. Anybody ever take French? No one here is doing French? Am I pronouncing it right? Probably. Probably. Okay, close enough. Okay, this is April 1775, so right after Lexington and Concord, through the Declaration of Independence. This is sometimes called the popular uprising phase. Okay, and this is the year of the revolution that probably more people supported the war than any other one. Why do you suppose there's so much support for the war this year? Any ideas? Go ahead, Isabel. They haven't really started fighting yet. Okay, they haven't really started fighting yet. They don't really know what war actually is going to mean. Anybody else? Any ideas? Okay. Some of it, this is like fury, and I've got some images here to show you guys. Kind of a neat quote. There's a historian named Charles Royster, teaches at LSU, and he's the guy who coined this phrase, Raj Militaire, and it comes from an observer in Philadelphia. Now, this guy's in Philadelphia. Keep that in mind. It's Philadelphia. It's not Boston. And the sentence is, the Raj Militaire, as the French call a passion for arms, has taken possession of the whole continent. The Americans are literally fighting mad. They're literally fighting mad, okay? And that's why there's so much support for the war. It's like this this wild passion, even the words, okay? Raj, what's rage? What's rage? Go ahead, Ivan. Anger, okay? Like intense anger. The Americans are just really furious. All this stuff has been building up, and it comes boiling out. And what's sort of interesting during this Raj Militaire phase, is the Americans are on the offensive. The Americans are actively taking the war to the British. And what we're going to look at is Raj Militaire in the north, the south, and then specifically in Boston. And what we're going to see is what's actually going on here is partly about the war. It's partly about what is the American war aims, okay? And different people have different ideas of what those war aims are. And the final thing I would say here is, okay, it starts April 1775, Lexington and Concord. What's July 76? What happens in July 76? Go ahead. Declaration Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence ends Raj Militaire. And popularity and support of the war begins to decline. Okay. That emotional edge doesn't last. The horrors of war kind of take the edge off that. It's hard to maintain a really high emotional peak for extended periods. Um, Maybe a a bad analogy, but when you meet somebody and you fall in love, you're in love with them and you can't stop thinking about them, stuff like that. At the 20th wedding anniversary, I love you. Yeah, me too. Uh, Could you pass the salt? Okay, it's, it's not the same thing, okay? The intensity of this first year fades away. Also, not all Americans support independence. We're going to look at somebody today who kind of fits that model. Okay? So, we're going to start with the North. Okay? Fighting breaks out at Lexington Concord in April. We talked about that. All right? Well, what's significant is fighting spreads to upstate New York. If we look at this map, we can see this is Lake Champlain. Okay? And at the southern end of Lake Champlain, there's this large British fort. It's called Fort Ticonderoga. And on May 10th, 1775, a group of American militia led by Ethan Allen, who's from Vermont, Benedict Arnold, we're going to talk about Benedict Arnold later today, sees Fort Ticonderoga because it's loaded with cannons. It's loaded with military equipment. This 
attack on the floor, it's not authorized by Congress. Congress is actually just meeting for the first time this day. We're going to pick that up a little bit later. It's authorized by the Massachusetts Committee of Safety and a bunch of angry guys in Vermont. Okay, they're taking the war to the English, okay? There's no reason this should happen, but it does. And over the next couple of days, and we'll see a map in a minute that expen extends on this, um, the American sees a second fort called Crown Point, which we really don't need to worry about. And Benedict Arnold actually raids Canada, okay? The Americans are taking the war to the Champlain Valley. They're taking the war to the British, okay? That's Raj Militaire. <clears throat> the second place you see is Boston. What's going on in Boston? We said these 20,000 Americans descend on the city of Boston, and the city's under siege. Well, this is the governor of Massachusetts. He's also British commander in North America. His name is Thomas Gage. Gage is kind of an interesting guy. Gage is married to an American. His wife is an American, maybe even an American spy. Those of you who are doing um, female spies, Gage's wife is somebody maybe to look at. Gage has been in America since the French and Indian War. He somewhat sympathizes with the Americans. He believes in liberty, but not in the American sense of what liberty is. And throughout the fall of 74 and the spring of 1775, Gage keeps asking for reinforcements. He keeps sending letters to England. The situation is pretty bad. We should send more reinforcements. Instead of sending Gage, re, or Gage, yeah, Gage reinforcements, the British send three more generals. A guy by the name of William Howe. We're going to talk about Howe later today. Howe's going to feature very prominently in your book, Washington's Crossing. A guy by the name of Henry Clinton. And a guy by the name of John Burgoyne. All these guys we're going to talk about later in this course. What do you suppose the significance is that Gage asks for reinforcements and Britain sends three generals? What, what's the, the ramification of that? Any ideas? Yeah. A lot of conflicting views as to what they should do. Like a lot of conflicting views. Anybody else? Yeah, Emily. The British don't think manpower is necessary at this point. Okay, they might not think manpower is necessary. Uh, they might think Gage is incompetent. Yeah, they might not have a lot of faith in Thomas Gage. When you ask for reinforcements and they send three more generals, that's not a huge vote of support. Kind of interestingly, the British ship that brings these three generals is HMS Cerebus. Cerebus is the three-headed dog that guards hell. And it's kind of interesting. The Americans say, see, one of those heads is for each of those generals. Okay? So this is Boston. You can see Boston is on this peninsula sticking out here. You can see this very narrow, it's called the Boston Neck, and the Americans are here at Roxbury and Cambridge, and they've got the British bottled up in Boston, okay? And here you can see Boston Harbor. Um, here you can see Castle William. Remember we read that document about the Boston riots, and the governor was writing from Castle William? He's fled, okay? That's where Castle Williams is. Well, what's interesting here, and this shows the American anger after uh, Lexington and Concord, the Americans don't just sit here. They don't try to storm the city. They could never get across the Boston Neck. But what the Americans do is they fortify this peninsula here. This is called the Charlestown Peninsula. And the theory here is if the Americans controlled this high ground, they could put artillery up here and potentially shell the city and make Boston Harbor untenable. And the Americans occupy this land on the night of um, June 16th. <clears throat> They're supposed to go to this hill called Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill is the back hill. There's actually two hills. Bunker Hill is about 40 feet taller than Breed's Hill, but in the darkness, the men get confused. They actually go to this forward hill called Breed's Hill. It's closer to, the Bos to Boston. In some ways, that's good. In some ways, it's bad. And over the course of the night, they dig a fortification. Okay, <clears throat> And when the British wake up on the morning of June 17th, they could hear some shoveling. They don't know what's going on. But when they hear the shoveling, they find somewhere in the neighborhood of two to 3,000 Americans have dug fortifications on Bunker Hill, or on Breed's Hill, technically, and are overlooking the city of Boston. Okay, <clears throat> And Thomas Gage decides that this is a threat 
you can't let those troops stay overlooking the city, and you've got to drive them back. And the man who Gage puts in tactical command, the guy who will command on the battlefield, is Sir William Howe. So Gage is in overall command. William Howe is tactical command. He's the commander on the ground. Okay? Now, if you're the British... And you see these Americans are up here on this hill. What would you guys do? How would you attack them? Would you leave them there? Would you attack them? What would you maybe do? Any ideas? Go ahead. I would swing around to the left over the bunker hill because it's 40 feet higher. Okay, so either here or here? And then look down upon them. Okay. And since you control the water, that's very doable. That's a pretty good plan. You'd also cut off their retreat route, okay? Anybody else? Neil? Use the British Navy to encircle that whole peninsula. Okay, yeah, you could use the British Navy to encircle the whole peninsula, shell the heck out of those guys. That would be a pretty good strategy. Anybody else? Those are all pretty good. That's not what Britain decides to do. That's not what Sir William Howe decides to do. Instead, he lines up 2,200 British soldiers shoulder to shoulder, and he sends them straight up the hill. Okay. Now, it's kind of interesting... British soldiers, and you can see this here, this is a relatively accurate painting. This is probably the second assault. We can see dead guys here, and I'll explain why we know it's not the third. They wear lots of belts, and the belts crisscross. Natural target points, okay? British officers wear a shiny metal disc around their throats called a gorget. A gorget is a symbol of authority. British officers rub the gorget so it would shine in the sun, Any bad things about having a shiny metal thing around your throat? Uh, People's dogs know exactly where to shoot. Yeah, they know exactly where to shoot, okay? Same with the crisscrossing belts. And the famous quote from Bunker Hill is, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. That's probably actually said. The British march up Bunker Hill, and the Americans fire their first volley at under 150 feet. And the British go down in waves. They're literally blasted down the hill. And they reform. William Howe puts them in line and sends them back up a hill a second time. Would you you say that this has a very hacksaw ridge-esque effect? Like every time they crawl up the the ridge, they just get wiped out? Oh, yeah. And they're crawling over their Own, own guys who went down the first wave. Why do you suppose Howe adopted this tactic? Why not swing around with the Navy? And why not isolate them? Why not shell them? Why line up guys and go straight up the hill? Yeah. Because it's well, always how they've been fighting. It's always how they've been fighting. Who are they fighting? Militia. The Americans. Yeah, they're, they're not going to stand up against British regulars. They're, they're way underestimating American ability. They're way overestimating British abilities. And the British march up the hill the second time, and they get blasted down the hill a second time. <clears throat> The way we know this is this third assault is the third assault, Howe calls for reinforcements. They bring over more soldiers from Boston. And the third assault, he lets them take off their backpacks. British soldiers carry about 60 to 80 pounds of equipment. The first two assaults, they're carrying their equipment. Third time, Howe says, maybe we don't need to carry the equipment up the hill. And the third time up the hill, the Americans have run out of gunpowder. And the British overrun Bunker Hill. The British capture Bunker Hill, okay? So Bunker Hill is technically a British victory. They seize the Charlestown Peninsula. Wait, are they going up Breeze Hill or Bunker Hill? Oh, well, Breeze Hill. It's, uh, that's a good point. It's technically the Battle of Breeze Hill, yeah. but it's remembered as Bunker Hill because Bunker Hill's the hill the Americans meant to be on, and in the darkness they picked the wrong hill. So the British win the Battle of Breeze Hill or Bunker Hill, and they've occupied the Charlestown Peninsula. Okay. But Bunker Hill is tremendously important because it has lots of ramifications. And it feeds in with this idea of Raj Militaire. We're going to pick that up in a minute. One of the legacies of Bunker Hill is the casualties. British soldiers take horrible losses at Bunker Hill. 268 British soldiers are killed. 828 are wounded out of about 22 or 2,400. Casualty rate of somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 to 50 percent. Um, William Howe is personally on the field. Almost all of William Howe's staff is killed. Howe 
miraculously is unhurt. Bullets are whizzing around him. They kill everybody around him, but they never hit him. Okay. Uh, two British regiments are completely wrecked, and the British in Boston are just horrified by this. Okay, you have to think about how small Boston is, and Boston is now filled with wounded guys, dying men. There's no place to send them. It's summertime. It's hot. The British Army is horrified by what exactly has happened here. And what's striking, and we'll pick this up a little bit later today, the British Army in Boston is largely inert for about the next nine months. They don't try anything again after this. They've just been pummeled by Bunker Hill. Okay, um, American losses at Bunker Hill. Hill are 115 dead and 305 wounded. Okay. <clears throat> a second result of Bunker Hill is even though the Americans have lost this hill, the Americans are greatly encouraged by this. It shows Americans will fight. Americans will fight like crazy. Uh, as the British ultimately seize the hill and enter this American earthworks, American soldiers stay and fight them with rocks, butts of guns. They don't have bayonets. And British officers comment that they've never seen soldiers stand up like that. They wouldn't, normal European troops would run. These angry Americans don't do that. Um, another legacy of Bunker Hill is tremendously heavy officer casualties. Very hard to put precise numbers on anything in any war, especially the American Revolution. But it's estimated that somewhere in the neighborhood of a about 12, 13 percent of all British officers killed in the American Revolutionary War are killed at Bunker Hill. Americans are targeting officers. They're shooting these guys down like crazy. Okay? <clears throat> and what's interesting is William Howe's response. He says, or not William Howe, Thomas Gage's response. He says, the Americans are now spirited up by a rage and an enthusiasm. Rage, okay, this anger. A rage is an enthusiasm as great as ever people were possessed of. And you must proceed in earnest or give the business up. Let's look at that quote. The Americans are now spirited up by a rage and an enthusiasm as great as ever people were possessed of. What, what does that mean? What's how, or Gage literally saying here? Yeah. Yeah, he says, I've never in my entire career seen anybody so angry. The Americans are, like, unbelievably angry. And then this next quote is very interesting. You must proceed in earnest or give the business up. What's that mean? Proceed in earnest or give the business up. Go ahead, Gabe. Yeah. He's telling Parliament, he's telling the British War Office, you need to send the whole army. This is full-blown war. This is not a little rebellion. And if you're not going to commit the entire empire, don't even bother. Okay? This is wildly out of control. Okay? And then you go back to that quote, the Raj Militaire has swept the continent. There's another guy. We're going to talk about him a little later. His name is Richard Montgomery. He's in New York City. So we've got Philadelphia, we've got Boston, we've got New York City. And this is what Richard Montgomery says about Bunker Hill. He says, see what the enthusiasm of liberty and an indignant sense of injury is capable of doing. Okay, enthusiasm, a tremendous anger, okay. He says, every friend of old England wishes this contest speedily concluded. If it lasts many months, she is done with us forever. What's that last part of the line mean? Every friend of old England wishes this contest speedily ended. If it lasts many months, she is done with us forever. What's that mean? What's this guy named Richard Montgomery saying here? Anybody? Go ahead, Isabel. Um, that everyone who's a supporter of England like wants this to be over fast, and if it's not, they're just going to give up. Okay. This war is wildly violent. And if this lasts very long, there's never going to be reconciliation. There's going to be too much blood spilled. And it shows you some people are still hoping for reconciliation. Richard Montgomery is one of them. We'll get back to him in a little bit. Okay. So this is Raj Militaire. Well, the final thing to say here, the final result of Battle of Bunker Hill, is Parliament relieves Thomas Gage. They see he's, he's failed. Okay. 
One of the things we're going to see, we talked about how the coming of the revolution, Britain kept going through prime ministers. Once the war breaks out, Britain keeps going through commanders in America. When you keep changing commanders, that's a bad sign. That's a sign the war's not going well because you can't pick somebody to stay. And Thomas Gage is relieved of command. He's sent back to England. The new commander is William Howe, the guy who fought at Bunker Hill. Now, what's interesting, he's going to show up very prominently in your Washington's Crossing book. Some historians have argued, and I don't want to give away too much of that book, that one of the problems with William Howe is William Howe is actually sympathetic to the Americans. He's a member of parliament and actually told his constituents he wouldn't fight against the Americans. Changes his mind when they offer him the command. But the other effect is some historians have argued um, that William Howe is traumatized by Bunker Hill. He's gun shy. And after Bunker Hill, he'll never commit his men in a major assault. Some say he, he's been, he, probably today you'd say he has PTSD. He, he's horribly scarred by seeing so much of his command shot down around him. Isn't he the one who sends waves of British people to die at Breed's Hill, though? He is. So why is Thomas Gage... Because he's an overall <laughs> command. So the guy in charge is the guy who who's, is messing up. And of those three generals who arrived, Howe is senior, so Howe is now the commander in North America. Okay. Makes no sense, but that's what happens. Okay. So that's Raj Militaire. Okay. Well, we've got another manifestation of Raj Militaire in the north, and this is the invasion of Canada. Now, we talked a little bit about Canada. The, Canada is new to the British Empire Treaty of Paris. Okay. We said there's like these 70,000 French Canadians there. Okay. And we said Parliament has just passed Quebec Act to try to appease the French Canadians. Okay? And we said Quebec Act extended the province of Quebec to the Ohio River. Quebec Act allowed Catholicism. Quebec Act allowed for an appointed assembly and the use of, of um, French law in the province of Quebec. What's interesting is the Americans think the French Canadians might want to join them. And maybe the Americans would be welcomed in Canada. Why do you suppose they might think that? Any ideas? Yeah. Still sour from the French Indian War. Okay, yeah, they're still sour. Maybe the French Canadians really haven't been assimilated into the empire, and maybe they would join this rebellion. Is there any downsides to that thinking? Yeah. They might be more interested in... France taking back that area. Okay, they might want the French back. Do you suppose the French Canadians have great love for Americans? Shaking your head no, Gabe. Why? I assume they helped the French in the French and Indian War. Yeah, they certainly did, okay? And the Americans helped the British. The Americans who pretty much started the war to begin with in the Ohio River Valley. Okay, that's part of it. The Americans aren't noted for being fond of Catholicism. Okay. They, they call the Quebec Act part of the intolerable acts. So whether the Americans are really going to be welcome in Canada is a, a bit of an open question. But Congress thinks they might be. One of the things that Congress is thinking about, and this is where the whole situation in Canada gets really, really complicated. There's like 70,000 French Canadians here, and these people are generically called the new subjects because they're new to England. But after the British conquered Canada, about 3,000 American and English merchants settled in Canada, and these people were called the old subjects. They were traditionally English. Turns out the old subjects don't like Quebec Act because they don't like that there's no elected assembly, and they don't like French law. They want common law, and they want an elected assembly. So throughout the spring of 1775, before Lexington and Concord, Americans are sending spies into Canada, and Canada is sending spies out, saying that the new subjects are indifferent, but the old subjects would welcome an American invasion. So Congress believes there's going to be support for an invasion of Canada. They also want Canada because if they would take Canada, they would get the British off their back door. This route down Lake Champlain is a traditional invasion route into the interior of New York and New England. That's why the Americans had seized Ticonderoga, because they're trying to stop this traditional invasion route. Congress also believes that if they, and this is kind of an interesting idea, if they could take Canada, it would show Parliament they were serious. Maybe Parliament would negotiate. 
And there was some talk that maybe you could even use Canada as a bargaining chip. We'll give you Canada back, like if you repeal Coercive Act, something like that, okay? <clears throat> Once again, the Americans invade, uh, captured Ticonderoga in May, so the time to invade Canada would have been June or July or August, or, you know, but Congress doesn't. Congress doesn't know what to do. Congress actually for a while considers inventorying all the captured cannons at Ticonderoga and then moving them to a safe place so they can give them back to England when the war is over. Because Congress still believes reconciliation is going to happen. But throughout the summer of 75, Congress begins to believe maybe reconciliation won't happen, and Congress authorizes an invasion of Canada, but they don't do this till the end of June. That's late, because it's going to take a couple of months for the armies to get ready, which means American armies aren't going to enter Canada until September or October. Why is that problematic? Logically, yeah, Dan. Uh, it's Canada in late fall. Okay, why is that bad? It's cold. It's really cold, cold, okay? Winter campaigning is not a good decision, but that's what Congress does. Congress doesn't quite know what's going on. Congress has, quite can't make up its mind what to do. So they ultimately adopt an invasion of Canada. It's interesting the... The actual order says, if the Canadian inhabitants don't mind. Well, how, how are you going to know? Are you going to ask them, well, is it okay if we invade? Yeah, okay, you can invade. All right. So Congress authorizes an invasion of Canada. There's going to be two prongs to this invasion. It's actually very smart. One prong led by Benedict Arnold, that guy who captured Fort Ticonderoga, is going to lead an army through the main wilderness, about 1,000 men, mainly New Englanders. And the theory was they would attack Quebec City directly. They would emerge out of the wilderness and attack Quebec City. This is Benedict Arnold. If you actually look at this painting, this is Quebec City in the background. And Arnold's march to Quebec turns to be a nightmare. Winter sets in earlier than they plan. He has about 1,100 men. The final 400 have most of the supplies. They turn back. They take all the supplies with them, so the other 700 are trapped in the wilderness with no food. Part of the problem for Arnold oops, is the Americans have a map from the coast of Maine to Quebec. What they, and the map says this route is about 160 miles. The map's off by about a factor of two to three. It's three or four hundred miles. So these guys get caught up here in the rivers of northern Maine and parts of southern Quebec in winter, and these men starve. These men are like walking scarecrows. This account is very heavily uh, recorded. Lots of Arnold's men leave diaries. Some historians have speculated it's New Englanders. New Englanders have high literacy rates. Uh, and you read about these guys' accounts. Um, they're eating squirrel tails. They're eating their shoes. They're eating their cartridge box. Some people have dogs. The dogs disappear relatively quickly because there's no food. And they're like walking scarecrows. But Arnold and 600 men make it to this place called Point Levy. And they cross the St. Lawrence to Quebec in November. And they call upon the city of Quebec to surrender. And the British laugh at them. There's 600 sc scarecrows. Uh, telling this walled city to surrender. They don't do it, okay? But Arnold does make it to Quebec. Historians at the time, well, writers at the time, compare this to Hannibal's march through the Alps with elephants, okay, against the Romans, okay? So this is Arnold. This is the famous route. This is the one everybody knows about because it's well documented. And also, it's Benedict Arnold, and Americans like Benedict Arnold because Benedict Arnold is kind of a, an interesting figure because he's a hero and he's a traitor at the same time. But the guy I want to focus on is the man who leads actually the main army in Canada, and it's actually the main invasion force. Nobody remembers him today, but his name is Richard Montgomery, and this is Richard Montgomery. And Montgomery's job was to take the city of Montreal. He was supposed to proceed up Lake Champlain. He was supposed to face the main British army. And the theory was if Montgomery attacked Montreal... The British would put all their force against him, and Quebec would fall without resistance. They thought the British wouldn't have anything left at Quebec. They were going to hit the two major cities of Canada simultaneously. 
Well, what's interesting about Montgomery is first, I did my doctoral dissertation on him, so that makes him fascinating, okay? And I told you guys earlier, I, I told my wife if we had ever a son, I would name him Richard Montgomery Gabriel, but mercifully that never happened, okay? But Montgomery's kind of an interesting guy because he shows us something about the coming of the revolution, he shows us something about conspiracy, he also shows us something about Raj Militaire. Montgomery is 37 years old, he's born in Ireland, and he's a former British officer, spends 15 years in the British Army. It's kind of interesting, three very high-ranked British, uh, or three high-ranked American general officers from the Revolution are all former British soldiers. They all seemingly know each other. One is a man named Horatio Gates, we'll talk about him later. One is a guy named um, Charles Lee, we'll talk about him later. But Richard Montgomery enters the army when he's 18 years old. He sees extensive service in North America in the French and Indian. He's at Ticonderoga. He's at Havana in the Caribbean. Catches a very bad case of um, yellow fever or malaria in the Caribbean. He'll later write that he loses most of his hair in the Caribbean. Okay. He fights in Pontiac's Rebellion. Extensive duty in North America. And on the way to fight Pontiac's Indians in 1765, Richard Montgomery's ship runs aground on the Hudson River, and he meets a wealthy American family called the Livingstons, who we're going to come back to later, meets their eldest daughter. She remembers when his regiment comes back. He's not there, and he's going to marry her at a future point. Following service in um, America, Montgomery goes back to England and seemingly um, sympathizes with the American position. He seems to be a political liberal for his time. And Montgomery grows disillusioned partly because he can't get promoted. Now, this is something to bring up a little bit. Um, at this point in history, British officers are partly promoted by merit, but it's also a purchase system. If you have enough money, you can buy yourself a commission. And there's a scale. So a second lieutenant is like 500 pounds. A first lieutenant is like 800 pounds. A captaincy is 1,500 pounds. A majority is 2,600 pounds. A colonel is like... So Montgomery's dad buys him a commission, and, you know, he slowly earns his way up, and he serves as a captain. But multiple times after the French and Indian War, remember we talked about the British Army is cut in size after the French and Indian, Montgomery gets passed over. He has the money, he's got the experience, he has combat experience, but he never can get promoted, and he gets disgusted, and he comes to America. He, he, he writes a very interesting letter to his cousin, and he says, I cast my eyes on America, where my pride and poverty will be much more acceptable. He's pretty wealthy, but by British standards, he's pretty poor. He settles in New York City, or near New York City, a place called Kingsbridge. And in 1772, marries the daughter, the eldest daughter of this wealthy American family called the Livingstons. Okay. What's interesting is Montgomery sees the coming of the revolution. He sees, you know, Boston Tea Party, doesn't seem to do anything. The thing that seems to politicize him is the Coercive Acts. The Coercive Acts cause him to enter the American service. He's a member of the New York Provincial uh, Congress. That's New York's revolutionary government. Okay. And in June 1775, because of his military background, Congress makes him a general. Congress picks him to be a general. Okay. And Montgomery's comments on being made a general are pretty interesting. I want to read this quote to you. Listen to the last line and think about what we've talked about in this class. Montgomery writes, The Congress, having done me the honor of electing me a brigadier general in their service, is an event which must put an end for a while, perhaps forever, to the quiet scheme of life I have prescribed for myself. Now listen to this line. He says... For though entirely unexpected and undesired by me, the will of an oppressed people compelled to choose between liberty and slavery must be obeyed. The will of an oppressed people compelled to choose between liberty and slavery must be obeyed. What's Montgomery saying? What's he believe in? This was on your test. Freedom. What? Freedom. Freedom? Or one of those IDs in his back 
the conspiracy. He believes in the conspiracy, okay? There's no doubt. Britain is out to take enslave the Americans. And Montgomery is put in command of the invasion of Canada. He's actually the number two officer. The number one officer gets ill, and Montgomery takes over. And Montgomery leads the main American army into Canada, just south of Montreal, just north of the current-day American uh, border, there's a British fort at a place called St. John's. And Montgomery lays siege to St. John's for 43 days. 43 days. And if you look at this map, this is a map actually dr drawn by the British commander of St. John's. And look at what he calls thick, swampy woods. Not a great place you'd want to spend 43 days in October. It rains incessantly and Montgomery becomes more and more depressed. He calls his army drowned rats crawling through the swamp, okay? But after 43 days, St. John surrenders. And when St. John surrenders, Montgomery captures almost all the British army in Canada. Almost the entire British army in Canada has been sent against him, and he's just destroyed it, okay? Montgomery proceeds on and occupies Montreal. Montreal surrenders without firing a shot. Montreal surrenders on uh, November 13th. So Montgomery has taken the eastern part of, or the western part of Canada and he's destroyed the British Army in Canada. The only thing that's left is Quebec City and about 70 regulars. They're the guys holed up in Quebec City facing Arnold. <clears throat> and Montgomery throughout this entire period, writes letters to his wife, his wife, and he repeatedly talks about being homesick and how he has moral qualms against fighting the British Army. Because he was a British officer for 15 years, and his great fear is he's going to have to fight his old regiment. He hears word that his old regiment is being deployed to America, and he writes something like, um, Heaven save me from having to fight my old regiment. He says, I feel more closely to those people than anybody on earth. I feel closer to the people of the 17th Regiment than I do even with my own family. God, I hope I don't have to fight these guys. And Montgomery, horribly homesick, increasingly disillusioned with American troops, advances to Quebec City. He meets Arnold outside of Quebec, and the Americans lay siege to Quebec. The Americans have about 900 men. Arnold had about 600. Montgomery had about 300. Montgomery left about 500 behind in Montreal. He works his way down to Canada, or to Quebec City. Montgomery lays siege to Quebec for about a month. He tries to shell the city. Quebec is a walled city. The American artillery is so light, the cannonballs bounce off them. Montgomery sends letters into Quebec City telling the British governor, a guy by the name of Guy Carleton, he should surrender. Guy Carleton sends the messages back unopened. Okay. Montgomery, who outranks Arnold, faces a huge problem, and that's on January 1st, most of Arnold's army's enlistment expires. Most of Arnold's army is going to go home on January 1st. So what Richard Montgomery decides is on the night of December 31st, 1775, to try to storm the city of Quebec. In the midst of a roaring blizzard, wild blizzard, um, the American army is demolished. Richard Montgomery is killed almost immediately, hits by grape shot in the face and in the groin, killed immediately. Um, Benedict Arnold is seriously wounded, and the American army in Canada is shattered. Okay. Now, what's interesting here, and this is where we're going to take a quick aside, is Montgomery becomes the great... Yes, go ahead, Brooke. Did they really only go in because all of their... Um, it, like, it was all going to expire? Yeah, they're going to go home. Yeah, that, that's why they attack. Because if we wait till January 1st, half the army's going home. Do they have any chance of actually... Um, you know, that's a debatable question. Our, uh, Montgomery believes he actually has a fighting shot because... He thinks the blizzard is going to, to hide them, okay? It didn't work, okay? And there's very wild accounts. Uh, Montgomery is literally leading the attack. There's these barricades. Montgomery literally grabs an action, is hacking his way through. He's the first guy through the gates, and he's the first guy killed, okay? Um, he, he really wants to go home. I mean, he really does. 
Montgomery becomes the first martyr of the revolution, or at least the first major martyr. There's a guy killed at Bunker Hill named Warren. But Richard Montgomery is the first and highest ranking American officer killed in, uh, general officer killed in the revolution. He's the highest American officer killed in the revolution, highest ranked. And kind of a, a, an odd irony, on the day Richard Montgomery is killed, his overall commander, who's back in Albany sick, writes him a letter and says, there's a rumor that you've been killed. I hope that's not true. And Congress just made you a major general. Congratulations. As he's writing that letter, Montgomery is being killed. Well, what's interesting, and if any of you would take the early Republic class next semester, we'll talk about this a little more. Uh, Montgomery becomes this major hero. This is a very famous painting by a man named John Trumbull. This painting is done in 1786. And if you would look, and you could put up all these other paintings, Montgomery, if you compare it to a lot of Renaissance painting, looks like Christ being taken down from the cross. And if you actually look, you can see these two battle flags, and they symbolically are making a cross. Richard Montgomery is like almost a, 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 a deity. Um, 17 states will name counties after Richard Montgomery. The first um, monument Congress ever approved and created and paid for is actually in honor of Richard Montgomery. It's in New York City at a place called St. Paul's Chapel. Richard Montgomery is buried in Quebec. The British bury him with honor. 43 years later, they dig his body up and they bring him back to New York City and they bury him in New York City. But this is Richard Montgomery. Um, Thomas Paine will write an appeal for independence using Montgomery's ghost to argue for independence. So Montgomery becomes this great hero. What's interesting is he doesn't want independence. We saw that one letter he wrote where he said, we hope, you know... Um, this thing ends quickly or England is through with, with us quickly. About two weeks before Richard Montgomery is killed, he writes a letter to his brother-in-law, who's a member of Congress, and he says, have the Americans approached any foreign powers and have they set a date beyond which reconciliation is impossible? He never gets an answer because he gets killed. But then he adds kind of an interesting postscript, post, postscript, post whatever, <laughs> an add-on, okay? That's going to look good on TV, okay? I hope and do verily believe that the ministry will not reduce us to this melancholy necessity. I hope we never have to adopt a position of independence. I hope they don't force us to do this, okay? So Richard Montgomery doesn't get killed dying for American independence. He gets killed dying for salutary neglect. The Americans want their rights back, and they want to be left alone, Okay? And the American army persists in Canada till the spring, but the American army in Canada is finished. We'll talk about this a little bit more next week. Horrible smallpox epidemic destroys what's left of it. But the invasion of Canada fails, okay? Canada won't become the 14th colony. It won't become a bargaining chip, all right? They try like crazy, but it doesn't happen. Now, I ask you guys to read a document, this, this translation of this British report on who collaborated. If anybody had the time to do that, throughout that document, it's called the Journal of Francois Baby, Gabriel Tashiro, and Jenkin Williams. It keeps talking about these people called the Boston A. Who's the Boston A? Does anybody know? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? I mean, you're basically right. <clears throat> I think you said it was like Americans in general. It's the Americans in general. It's interesting. The French Canadians think anybody who's an American is from Boston. They're a New Englander. All Americans are Boston A. And if you actually look at the way the Americans spell it, it's not B O, it's B A, Baston, because of that nasally accent. Okay? That document keeps talking about the ha habitants. Who are the habitants? Anybody pick that up? Were they, were they the French? Uh, hey. Yeah, they're the French Canadians. That's exactly right. the common people, the farmers, okay? So those are the people who we don't know if they're going to help the Americans or not. That, that's what everything was ultimately riding on. From that document, the, uh, the Francois Baby Journal, did you see any ways the French Canadians helped Americans? Anybody see anything? This is question number two that I passed out. Yeah. I uh, hope they, they protect the, the spies. I haven't written down my notes, but like in, in what I read was there were three spies that stayed, and there was a, um, 
a, a notice sent to have them removed. And then the general that was supposed to remove them um, told told um, a friend of his that, that they needed to get them out before. Okay. They... So they eight American spies coming in and out of Canada. Anything else they did? Yeah, Neil. Several French Canadians smuggled food and armaments. Okay, they, they, they arm them. They provide them food. Anybody else see anything they do? Some of them stand guard. Some of them build signal fires for the Americans. Some of them fight with the Americans. Not that many. Did anybody see anything why the Americans aren't welcome in Canada? There's one or two things. You have to actually have to read it fairly carefully. Hey, buddy. If it looks repeatedly, it says the Americans buy provisions and they don't give them cash. They give them IOUs. What's the matter with doing that? Why? Can't pay someone if you're dead. Okay, can't pay someone if you're dead. Anything else that's bad about IOUs? What's the IOU sort of implying? Well, they never really get it. They don't get it, okay? They're assuming the Army's going to stay in Canada and Canada's going to become part of the United States. What if that doesn't happen? Well, those IOUs are worthless. Why don't you suppose the Americans in Canada don't just pay for cash? Like, why not just give the French Canadians like gold coins and stuff? Why give them paper IOUs? Yeah. They don't have any hard currency? They don't have any. Okay? They can barely feed themselves. And as the American army stays in Canada, they begin to just requisition supplies. They just begin to take things because they're starving to death. But that doesn't build a lot of confidence among the French Canadians. Okay? And the British keep saying, if these guys can't feed themselves and they're taking your food, what do you suppose the odds are they're going to protect you? What are the odds are they're going to treat you well if you become part of the United States? So the American invasion of Canada is doomed. Okay? Probably always was doomed, but it's, it's definitely over. But there is a silver lining, like poor Richard Montgomery and all these other guys who died of smallpox don't die in vain, because this is a major diversion for the British. For the rest of the war, Britain will be forced to send somewhere in the neighborhood of as many as 12,000 troops to Canada to reconquer it. They're going to have to permanently keep four to 6,000 troops to keep Canada loyal, or at least under control. And... By diverting troops to Canada, there's less troops to fight in the main lower 13 colonies, okay? So in a sense, the invasion of Canada works out okay for the Americans, but it's at very, very, very high loss, all right? So that's Raj Militaire in the north, okay? But fighting's also spreading to the south, okay? We've talked about Boston, talked about New York, talked about Canada. Well, Virginia, Virginia's a royal colony, most populous, wealthiest, geographically largest royal colony. And the royal governor of Virginia is a man by the name of Lord Dunmore. And as early as May 1775, right after Lexington and Concord, Lord Dunmore seizes all the gunpowder held at the capital, Colonial Williamsburg. Anybody ever been to Colonial Williamsburg? Ever see the, the powder magazine, the big brick building? They seize all the gunpowder there because he doesn't want the American rebels to get it. And throughout the summer of 75, Dunmore fights these little skirmishes with American militia, partly led by a guy named Patrick Henry. Give me liberty or give me death, that guy, okay? The other thing Lord Dunmore does, and we're going to pick this up later in this class, but in November, Lord Dunmore issues a proclamation that he tells slaves, any slave who enters British area and takes up arms will be set free. And what Dunmore is doing, he's creating a force made up of a handful of British regulars, loyalists, and slaves. And by the fall of 1775, he has about 1,200 of these people in the area around Norfolk, Virginia. Dunmore flees to a British warship. You'll see all these guys. We saw British authority collapse in New Jersey in the Benjamin Franklin book. Okay, British authority in New York collapses. British authority all across America is collapsing. Dunmore is on a British warship. Okay, well, in December, Dunmore lands his combined force of about 1,200 at a place called Great Bridge. And at Great Bridge, they try to uh, defeat an American militia force and take the city of Norfolk. And the Americans defeat Dunmore's force at Great Bridge. Okay, so the Battle of Great Bridge is an American victory that secures Virginia for the colonist cause. 
December 9th, 1775, okay? So at the same time Montgomery's in Canada, there's fighting in Virginia. Just to wrap Dunmore up, Dunmore hangs around off the coast in the small British squadron, and on January 1st, he burns the city of Norfolk to the ground. He burns it. Some will argue that very much alienates British sympathies in Virginia, because if Dunmore will burn a city, will he burn other cities? Will the British burn anything? Talked about how do you win this war? How do you make civilians like you? How do you promote the loyalist population? Maybe burning cities isn't the answer. And very soon after burning uh, Norfolk, disease breaks out on Dunmore ships. Dunmore ships scatter. Dunmore goes to Florida, later goes to Staten Island. But what's sort of tragic, and we'll pick this up later, the slaves, the slaves who had fled, the slaves are taken to the West Indies and they're sold as slaves. Okay, the British didn't free them, they just moved them from Virginia to Barbados. All right? So Virginia has been secured. The same situation is happening in North Carolina. There's a royal governor in North Carolina who's fled to a warship. This is a man by the name of Josiah Martin. And Josiah Martin issues a very bombastic, bold proclamation. I want to read you part of this. Uh, Martin issues this proclamation in January 1776. He says, A most daring, horrid, and unnatural rebellion is exerted in this province by base and insidious artifices of certain traitorous, wicked, and designing men. That's a lot. That's really bad. Okay? And then he called upon all loyal people to rise to the British standard. He calls on all males to join the British cause. He says, all such rebels who will not join the royal banners, rebels and traitors, their lives and properties will be forfeited. Okay, If you don't join, we'll kill you and we'll take your property. Dunmore's, pro or not Dunmore, um, Martin's proclamation very much resonates in North Carolina. We talked about North Carolina and the regulator movement. We said North Carolina is badly divided, east versus west. There's lots of different ethnic groups in rural North Carolina. There's Scotch-Irish, there's Germans, there's Highland Scots, and a force of about 1,500 Highland Scots who are very much loyalists begin to march towards the coast. There's word that a British naval squadron is approaching North Carolina. And if this British naval squadron could meet these 1,500 loyalists, maybe they could subdue North Carolina. Well, on February 27, 1776, another battle is fought. This one is called the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge. Battle of Moores Creek Bridge, February 27, 1776. This is Moores Creek Bridge. It's a little bridge over this deep, swampy stream called Moores Creek. And what the Americans did is they took the plankings off the bridge and they greased them. And the Americans are on this side of the bridge with guns, and there's about 1,500 loyalists on the other side in kilts, bagpipes, and carrying broadswords. And crying out, King George and broadswords, they try to walk across the runners of the greased bridges under fire. What do you suppose their odds are? Bad. Okay, that, that, that's an understatement. They get slaughtered. The Americans lay the planking down, counterattack, and within a couple of days, about 40 of these people have been killed and over 800 have been captured. And North Carolina is now secure for the Patriot cause. Virginia has been secured at Great Bridge. North Carolina is secured at Moores Creek Bridge. Okay, the Patriots are taking over. We've got a final case, this one in South Carolina. South Carolina has another royal governor. This man's name is William Campbell. William Campbell flees to a British warship. That's what all royal governors do is they flee. Campbell has heard that a naval force eventually is going to come to Charleston because Charleston is a major southern city. It's the best port south of New York. It's also a very rich area. Lots of slaves, rice, indigo. And in early June, this British naval squadron arrives off the coast of Charleston. 
This naval squadron was supposed to go to North Carolina, but they were delayed by storms. And by the time they arrive at North Carolina in March, they find out about Morris Creek Bridge. North Carolina's been lost, so they go to South Carolina. And on June 28, 1776, the British Navy attacks Charleston in what's called the Battle of Sullivan's Island. This would be the Battle of Sullivan's Island. Anybody ever been to Charleston? What do you think of Charleston, Matt? Still okay, so it's very old, very historic, okay? <clears throat> Pretty nice place, actually, okay? The British Navy has a disaster. The Americans are firing very, very accurately. They shoot the heck out of two British warships. A third British warship gets stuck. The British are forced to burn it because they're afraid the Americans will capture it. And the British are repelled at Charleston. And South Carolina is now secured for the colonists' cause. So the three major southern colonies have all been secured. The royal governor of Georgia flees. Georgia is now secured. The Americans have secured the Deep South. This is a very famous painting of the Battle of um, Sullivan's Island. This man is Sergeant Jasper, very famous soldier, or a very famous story. This fort, it's called Fort Sullivan, or Fort Moultrie, is made out of palmetto logs and filled with sand. They absorb British cannonballs. The Americans will later recover something like 3,000 cannonballs. Well, their flagstaff gets shot down, and they're afraid if the flag goes down, people might think Fort Sullivan has surrendered. So Sergeant Jasper stands up here on the battlements under fire, and he reattaches the flagpole. Very famous scene. You'll find about 20 different versions of Sergeant Jasper at Sullivan's Island. About two years later, um, Sergeant Jasper tries this again, and he gets killed. Okay, he probably shouldn't have pressed his luck. But the whole story here of Raj Militaire in the South is the Deep South is being secured to the Patriot cause. Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. And there will be no more fighting in the Carolinas or actually anywhere in the South until 1778. That means these colonies can contribute support, troops, resources to the fight in the North. It means these governments can coalesce. It means these people can coerce loyalists and cow the loyalists into place. Was there a decisive battle in Georgia? Georgia is very new. Georgia is only settled in the mid-1730s. Very small population. And with everything else falling apart in the south, uh, the governor literally flees. They actually arrest him and he escapes and goes on a warship. Okay, So there's, uh, Georgia rolls over, doesn't even fight. Okay, <clears throat> so that's Raj Militaire in the South. Well, we have one last topic, and that's Boston. Okay, the Siege of Boston. Let's go back to our very first picture here. Boston has been under siege ever since Bunker Hill. The Americans can't get in. The British can't get out. George Washington shows up immediately after Bunker Hill and assumes command of this 20,000-man force and begins to turn it into the main Continental Army. Your book, Washington Crossing, begins at this point. Washington meets all these guys who are New Englanders. He's never seen a New Englander before. He's got to figure out. They have black soldiers. Washington has qualms about that. Okay, But Washington doesn't have the strength to get into the city. The British don't have the strength to get out. And for the next nine months, Boston remains under siege. There's periodic skirmishes. The British have a very tough time provisioning themselves. There's not any food in Boston. It has to all be brought in overseas, or they'll land little raiding parties. There's lots of little battles, like this place called Noodles Island, uh, for livestock, for sheep, stuff like that. But what the Americans need is they need cannons. They need cannons that can blast the British out of Boston. And the Americans, remember, they do have cannons at Fort Ticonderoga. There's about 60 very big, heavy cannons at Ticonderoga. So in the winter of 1776, whoops, George Washington sends a man named Henry Knox, who will be the chief of his artillery, to Ticonderoga. This is Ticonderoga in the background. And they load these 60 heavy cannons onto sleds driven by oxen, and they drag them from Lake Champlain to Boston. It's about 200 miles. It takes about eight weeks. One of the real forgotten events of the American Revolution, but a very important event, because the Continental Army is getting heavy artillery. 
is getting big, heavy, powerful cannons. Okay. And Knox arrives back at Boston sometime in late February or early March. And that gives Washington an idea. Let's go back to our first map. I probably should have put one earlier or later. Can't do anything with the Charlestown Peninsula because the British are occupying it. Doesn't really do anything to put them here, but you've got this place called Dorchester Heights. Dorchester Heights overlooks Boston Harbor. It overlooks the city. It's got high ground. Looks a lot like Breed's Hill. And in early uh, March 1776, George Washington puts his heavy artillery on Dorchester Heights, making Boston untenable. American artillery can sink any ship in Boston Harbor. They can shell the city. William Howe, British commander, wakes up and finds heavy American cannons overlooking the city. William Howe could fight. He could land troops here. He could line them up and do Bunker Hill all over again. William Howe, though, has lost his stomach for bloody linear combat. And what William Howe does is on St. Patrick's Day, 1776, William Howe evacuates Boston. The British Army leaves Boston, goes to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Okay, the British go to Halifax. When the British leave, about a thousand loyalists go with them. And you're going to see something. Every time the British evacuate an area, thousands of loyalists will go with them. Loyalists don't want to be left behind. They don't know what the Americans are going to do to loyalists. Okay, that's maybe not a particularly wonderful prospect. The other thing that's interesting about the evacuation of Boston, and people don't actually remember this, is that for all practical purposes, the war in New England is over. There's almost no major fighting in New England after this point. There's periodic coastal raids. Um, the British will take Newport, Rhode Island, and the Americans will lay siege to it, but there's no fighting. And for all practical purposes, the American Revolution in New England has ended. Okay, the war will go on another seven years, but the fighting in New England is pretty much over. All right. The other thing that's kind of interesting here, and to bring Raj Militaire to a close, and nobody remembers this, but it's factually correct, when the British Army leaves Boston, aside for places in the Great Lakes like Detroit and Fort Niagara, there are no more British soldiers left in the 13 colonies. The Americans have driven the British Army out. It looks like the Americans have won the revolution. British authority in America has collapsed, and there is no more British military presence south of Quebec and north of St. Augustine, Florida. The British are gone. Okay? The American rebellion seemingly has succeeded. All right? Raj Militaire has been a very big year. The Americans are literally fighting mad, and they're not going to take it anymore. Okay? So we'll close it here. Any questions for anybody? Any concerns? Yes, Isabel. Um, whenever they were evacuating the city, did uh, the Americans just let them go? Yeah, there's some thought of maybe trying to sink them, but they figure it's better probably to just get them gone. Okay? It's interesting, too, when the Americans enter the city, they find the British trash Boston. They, they, they beat the heck out of Boston. Um, they use churches as stables. Uh, they burn everything in sight for firewood. So, like, you know, they take shingles and all fences are gone. The British have just trashed Boston. But that's not surprising. The British didn't like Boston. Boston's the home of the massacre and the Tea Party. The British are really revengeful on Boston. Okay? Yes? So when uh, Lord Dunmore, like, frees, not, like, not frees his slaves, but, like, asks them to join, like, what is the result of that for, like, the pe people that are patriots? Um, well, see, that's a heck of a question. What do you suppose the results would be? I feel like I read somewhere that, like, this made them, like, distrust Britain even more. Like, if they were going to free their slaves, like, what would be reconcil able to reconcile? Them? Okay, that's exactly right. That goes back to that question we asked. How does Britain win? It makes lots of sense to, to, to free slaves and ask them to fight their masters. It's not going to make loyalist slaveholders real happy, though, because if you'll free some slaves, will you free all slaves? Will you free only ones that help you and not ones that don't? What if they don't help you, but you're a loyalist? You know what I mean? It creates lots of... But Dunmore's not thinking big long-term. He needs to hold Virginia, and he thinks slaves are the way to do it. Okay? Yes, James. About the Virginia royal governor. Yes. Uh, you said he burned Norfolk. 
the day after he was defeated on the um, it, it's, If I said a day, I'm right. It's January 1st. It's about three weeks later. When he retreated, did he still have men to go from to burn that city down? Yeah, he loses about 300 men at Great Bridge. He's got about 1,200. They flee to ships, and the ships just hold, stay offshore. And early on the morning of January 1st, they start to shell the city, and they land landing parties and burn most of the city. Yeah, then they leave. What's sort of ironic, um, Norfolk has very strong tie, trade ties with the British Empire, and most people in Norfolk are actually loyalists, so they burn a loyalist city, okay? And they leave about four houses, and the Americans come in and burn those, okay? So Norfolk is literally burned to the ground, okay? Anybody else here? Yes? When they're in Boston, the British, is that when they cut down the Liberty, Liberty Tree? Yes, yeah. Anyone else here? Okay, then I will see you guys next class. And I uh, hope you got something out of it. We'll see you next time. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3. Sunday on Q&A, author and columnist James Grant. I make my living by writing about markets uh, in something called Grant.